Will you pray with me? Draw near, O oh God. Send your spirit to this place and pour out your spirit on the words that we will hear so that we may learn something new of you and this world you so love. In your son's name we pray. Amen. What a gift it is to be gathered in worship with such a committed group of people who are excited to serve. I am so thrilled to have an opportunity for worship to lead right into action, giving us a chance to live out the words we say. But you all know as well as I do that it doesn't take a day like this to have an opportunity to serve. Because if we're honest, you don't need the church to organize your opportunities to service. The Christian commitment to service is not unique. Service is mainstream. People don't need a church to serve. I hope you know many people who don't belong to faith communities who are very committed to service in our city and beyond. There are so many ways to step up and serve a community. And I'm glad that we have people who do that, who spend Saturdays hammering nails and planting trees and sorting food, regardless of whether or not they are affiliated with a faith community. Because we need people to serve. Service has just become integrated into society. And so it's become something that can happen because we want to get something out of it for ourselves. We serve so that we can put it on college applications or grad school applications. People serve so that they can demonstrate good character before a promotion. Service can be competitive. Ask any Teach for America teacher what that application process was like, and you shouldn't be surprised to hear that it was likely harder to get accepted to Teach for America than to get admitted into grad school. And so the question for us is, what are we to make of Christian service? Is it any different than a, just a general commitment to service? Why do Christians serve if we don't need faith to be committed to our communities and to service? In the final days leading up to Jesus' death, he was bombarded with questions from people who were trying to build a case against him. They wanted to trip him up and catch him in the act of saying something blasphemous. And so you may remember when the Pharisee asked him, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Surely that would trip Jesus up, considering that there are 613 commandments in the Old Testament. But Jesus responds by saying this, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. All of the laws can be boiled down to these two. These commands are the hinges of our faith. And that is what sets apart Christian service from other good-hearted service. Christian service is never about resume building or making ourselves feel better, even if those are byproducts. Christian service is always about answering the command to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so we ask ourselves, who is my neighbor? And how do I love them as I love myself? It doesn't require a Northridge Serves Day to do that. Because as Christians, we are charged to embody this command, living in a way that shows our love for God and love for neighbor every day. And our scripture this morning spells out what it looks like to embody that command. So hear now these words from 1 Thess Thessalonians. But we appeal to you, brothers and sisters, to respect those who labor among you, and have charge of you in the Lord and admonish you, esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, beloved, to admonish the idlers, encourage the faint-hearted, support the weak, be patient with all of them. See that none of them repays evil for evil, 
but always seek to do good to one another and to all. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you've been around Northridge for a while, I hope this scripture sounds vaguely familiar. If you are newer to Northridge, then these words may sound familiar once we get to the end of worship today. One thing that sets this community apart is that together we recite a charge at the end of worship each week. It is a statement about how we are charged to live in this world And it is based on the scripture that we just read together. So if you're wondering what it looks like to love your neighbor, you can refer to our charge. That gives you 10 simple instructions for how to love your neighbor. That's what it boils down to, after all. Instructions for each of us about how to live out that love every day. The charge was one of the first things that I learned about as I learned about this community. And it quickly became clear to me that these are not just words that get recited week after week. These are words that this community has chosen to embody in a really real and tangible way. You hear the words of these charge come up in various meetings as people discuss ideas and commitments. These are the words that guide this community in and beyond these walls. These are the words that lead you to love your neighbor as yourself. And I am so grateful that this morning we have someone who is going to share with us how you've embodied the words of these charge, of this charge and loved her as you've loved yourself. And so I'm so grateful to Majuma who is going to share some of her story with us. Hi, here we are. Hi everyone, my name is Mwajuma Katembo. Can you all hear me? Okay, thank you. I'm a college student at Texas A&M Commerce University, working toward a degree in education. I plan to be a teacher. My family is from Democratic Republic of Congo, but I spent my early child in refugee camp Zambia. When I was 12 years old, my family moved to Dallas My family first visited Northridge as part of Northridge Without Border program. Some of my memories included tutoring sessions after church. This was very important to me because I didn't have much schooling in my refugee camp. Claire Stein reminded me that one time when tutoring session was canceled, I cried. (laughs) Another memory I have of Northridge is feeling welcome by a lot of people here Different families drove me to church and I remember feeling loved and special. I remember singing Shambra Like Diamond with Mary Lee. I remember teaching Claire Stein some Swahili and Regina, my cousin, laughing at her pronunciation. (laughs) I was the first person in my family to graduate from high school. While I was in high school, Claire asked me if I was wanting to go to college. I paused for a minute and I was like, yes, I want to go to college but I did not think that could be possible because of tuition and you know. So I studied for the SAT and Claire and Steve and I researched schools and made some choices. Uh, I got accepted in, at Texas Women University in A&M Commerce. Lee, jo- Lee Jones took me on a school tour at Texas Women University. Then Claire and I went to Commerce the same summer. I got accepted there. Then we had like some excitement, screaming, and there was a lot going on that time. (laughs) Then the question came, how am I supposed to pay for college? I got accepted, but how am I supposed to pay? Uh, We're like, well, there's always a way, always. We We worked really hard and got some scholarships, but the issue was it was not enough. Then I asked, are you sure I'm gonna go to this college because I don't have enough? Uh, then the church here at Northridge offered the Bain and Jean scholarship, and that's what made it possible for me to, call, to go to college. I'm now in my fourth year and accept to graduate next year. 
I love my classes, I love my friends there. I was, I was even able to get a job at International Rescue. And some of y'all might remember me, I came here with the youth. Um, and I'm now an instructor at Texas A&M Commerce, uh, teaching a first year track class. I never believed I would get to go to college. I'm really grateful to this church and everyone here for everything y'all invested in me and your support, that really meant a lot to me. And thank you for believing in me even when I doubted myself, thank you. Did you hear it? How you strengthened the faint heart of a 12-year-old refugee? Did you hear how you helped the suffering? Plenty of people could have served her. They didn't need this church to serve her. They could have helped her meet her basic needs. They could have supplied food and housing and school assistance, and some of them did. But your service was rooted in something deeper. Your service was an embodiment of the words that we say each week, and love was made manifest because you were serving out of love for neighbor. And because of that, your service has endured. You did those acts long before I showed up, and yet here is this relationship that endures because of your love for neighbor. We don't have a monopoly on service. But as Christians, our service is different than serving to feel good or build a resume. And so remember that today as you serve others. Remember that today is a chance to embody the words we say each week and demonstrate what love of neighbor looks like. Because loving your neighbor is loving God. Isn't our world desperate for this kind of service, this kind of witness? Fear and anxiety have pulled at the seams of so much. Fear is the thing that keeps us from loving our neighbors. But let us be a community that is committed to a different kind of witness, a different kind of service. Let us be a community that continues to embody the words we proclaim each week, showing our love for God through our love for neighbor. That is how the name of Jesus will be forever blessed. Amen.